thank you very much for uh, joining our online service for, uh, for ACPC. It's a shame that you, we can't all be together uh, in person, uh, but at least we can do this, and uh, I'm sure that we can worship God together uh, really well uh, today. And um, it's great to have our, our team, be able to have our, at least have our team here at the church um, uh, deploying this service. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a call to worship from um, Psalm 123, uh, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. And right now, with lots of stuff going on in the world, we, we are definitely looking uh, for God's mercy. So uh, wherever you're at, um, stay, you know, focus on Him as we sing, and uh, let other thoughts proceed to the background. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, great to have you here today. I'm online for a lot of you. Um, I guess you know we we ask that you you know sing sing praises with us um, from wherever you are in Auckland, and as we as we worship together in God's name.
verse that I think is incredibly appropriate uh, to the, our current time. Uh, it's from James um, chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. It says, now listen, James says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And of course, I, mean, I think this is appropriate because as right now there's a lot of uncertainty um, in New Zealand and around the world about what conditions are going to be like uh, on a week-to-week -week or even day-by-day -day basis. Uh, today, we're in level 2.5 in Auckland. Uh, next week, we might be in level 1, maybe level 3. You know, we, we, we just don't know. It's not under our control. It's not under the government's control. It is a um, question of what happens with the virus and, and a lot of different factors that we just can't predict. Uh, and, and for me, I think this is actually quite unusual. Uh, I'm used to knowing with reasonable degree of certainty what I'll be doing in a week or a month. Uh, what, what, my, what my life will be like, what I'll be allowed, what I'll be able to do and not able to do. And so um, this kind of uncertainty can be very unsettling. And I think it's unsettling for a lot of people, myself, my, people in my family, and, and a lot of other people. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think this actually speaks to the incredible privilege that, we, that I and, and people around me usually live with. In times past, people would have to worry about, people would be thinking about, you know, is it going to rain? Are my crops going to wither? Are we going to be attacked? Are we going to be invaded? Is the, is the local lord going to go you know, punish us for no reason? That's all those sorts of things. So the stability that we're used to having in our lives, I think, is historically unusual. And we should be very grateful for that. And this uh, pandemic should remind us how privileged we normally are. Um, and there's also a great opportunity for us to reflect on, uh, on God and our relationship with him. Uh, you know, when the scriptures tell us to um, put our trust in God, to, um, that God loves us, that he cares about us, um, and that we need to put our trust in him, I mean, that's, for most people, you know, that would have really resonated because of the uncertainty in their lives. And, and when we get very complacent, because um, then we don't perhaps feel the impact of those scriptures the way that we should. We don't put our trust in God the way that we should, because, you know, a lot of the time we feel like we don't need to, to be honest. So now, I think it's clear that we definitely do need to. And, um, and so uh, we, can, we can learn from this. We can, we can put our trust in him. Uh, also, the other lesson I think we can take from this time is um, to seize the moment. You know, um, James says, you know, just focus on what's at hand. Uh, Jesus says that as well in the Gospels. Um, we need to be doing, we've got an opportunity to do good, to have our friends around. Uh, you know, we, we should do that while we can. Um, to uh, gather together as a church. You know, we should do that while we can. If you're thinking, most of the time you might think, oh, you know, I, I don't really feel like going to church today. Maybe next week I'll go. Well, maybe next week you won't be able to go. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to take every opportunity to do these things. Um, and, I mean, you know, other, all kinds of other things, going shopping, maybe getting a haircut. Um, there are lots of things that we, we've got the opportunity to do right now that we might need to do now and not later. Uh, so I think those are two really important uh, lessons that, that we should take right now from this time. Uh, now I'm going to pray for, for the church and for the world. Uh, Lord, uh, you have given us you know, huge blessings even during this time of trouble. Uh, here in New Zealand, Lord, things seem relatively uh, good and we are able to do a lot of things that people in other places cannot do, either because they're not allowed to or because they're afraid to, because uh, it's too dangerous. Um, and so um, I really thank you, Lord, that uh, we have these opportunities, and I pray that we will take these opportunities to, um, to make the most of the time and the conditions that we have. Um, help us, Lord, to not be afraid uh, unnecessarily, uh, but to be duly cautious. Um, Lord, let us, um, let people all around us and, and ourselves as well um, take all the necessary precautions, um, wearing masks and um, you know, just limit, limiting our interactions when necessary, Lord, uh, so that we can, not, not really for our own sake, Lord, but to protect the people around us, um, because you've told us to uh, make let's see other people's uh, needs as higher priority than our own. Um, thank you for this church, Lord. Um, we really pray for 
um, for the sale of the building, Lord, that that will uh, come to pass, even um, both by some means. And uh, we pray for the work that's going on in the new building, Lord, that the plans will be excellent and that the resources that you've given this church um, will be used for, for your maximum glory. Uh, Lord, we really look out to the world where there is um, even more uncertainty and, and, and problems than here, Lord. And we ask the Christians everywhere will, uh, will hold the needs of others higher than their own and um, will be great witnesses to you uh, in this time of pressure, Lord, because we have this incredible hope um, in you and your son Jesus uh, and in his return. Um, we have a hope that transcends um, any earthly problems, Lord, and we ask that you know, that they'll, they'll be real to us uh, and in our lives and our witness uh, during this time. Uh, we pray for the upcoming election here in New Zealand, Lord. Um, there's a lot to think about. We pray that we will think clearly, that um, we will discern the truth, uh, that we will be able, and we will be able to weigh up um, the trade-offs, Lord, in choosing um, our elected leaders. We pray for a huge, just a huge amount of wisdom as we do that. We, but we, and um, I also pray, Lord, that that our, our spirit will be um, will be joyful that we get to do this, um, and and not angry or um, fearful or uh, any of those negative things, Lord, but that we will simply be glad to do our duty uh, as as citizens, Lord, for those of us who can vote. And uh, really, really grateful that we can do that, Lord. And uh, yeah, and we pray for the outcome that. The leaders that we have uh, will be um, people who are really competent and to, to lead our country with the policies that will um, maximise the flourishing of the people of this country. Um, I really thank you uh, for watching over us and being our God and brought at all times good and hard and, and, and good. I pray this in your whole time. Okay, now we're going to go on to the um, have the. Uh, Offering and was and the announcements and that sort of stuff interlude. on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. The point twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Warnerges, which means son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Elphus, Thaddeus, son Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. 
in Mark chapter 6, verse 6 to 13. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, no belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. May God bless the reading and understanding of the books. Thank you so much, uh, Samuel, and uh, great to, uh, to have our little group here today recording the service for you. And um, yeah, wonderful to be together, um, if, uh, if not in person, but certainly in spirit, worshipping the Lord and hearing God's word together. A recent article in the New Zealand Herald highlighted the reality of our MMP system. New Zealand First has been in coalition with the Labour Party to form our government with uh, Greens uh, providing confidence and supply. Now New Zealand First must fight for its political survival, as possibly the Greens do as well, after recent events. And the Right Honourable Winston Peters is nothing if not a fighter. As you can see in this cartoon, it's no more Mr Nice Guy as far as Labour's performance is concerned. You see, he must differentiate himself from his coalition partner so that he can survive into another term of office. In fact, every party must make it clear to the voting public what they stand for so that they can make a choice. We're going to look today at choices that people make about the good news. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark together. Mark repeatedly asks the reader, who is Jesus to you? And then what are you going to do about it? For those of us who have been following Jesus for years, this question is no less important. Will we live a life of submission to the Lordship of Christ? Or will we settle for worldly counterfeits like power, pleasure and popularity? Will we choose the cross or a cushion? We're going to look at two choices today. First, the choice that the disciples made. And second, the choice made by one King Herod. And I've entitled the two sections, The Training of the Twelve, and the cornering of the king. So we're going to start with the training of the twelve. Back in the annals of history in the dim dark past when I went to university and I got involved in a campus student group, student life, the Bible study leader asked our little group a question and it was this. Why did Jesus come to earth? We answered, well, to die and rise again for our sins and um, teach us stuff and and as we went along uh, we soon ran out of ideas one of the things we did not mention was this to train the 12 to train the 12. samuel read to us from uh, mark chapter 3 13 to 19 and in verse 14 we read this he jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Notice the two aspects. He wanted them to, first of all, be with him, and secondly, to send them out to preach. As I said last week, class was always in the session. Why did Jesus calm the storm, for instance? So they wouldn't all die? Sure. So they would understand more fully who Jesus really was? Of course. But also, it was a faith lesson for the disciples. Have you no faith? Jesus asked them. 
talk about creative learning experiences, eh? Sign me up for that course. You really get stuck in. On second thoughts, I get seasick. So maybe I will just take the online version of the course, if that's okay. As we come to chapter six, an important milestone in Jesus' curriculum is reached, the field trip. Now my daughter Ellie's in year 13 at high school. What a year it's been for every student plus all of us. But uh, she signed up for geography because uh, the year 13 geography trip is famous in the school because they get to go to Rotorua, they sample a whole lot of different uh, tourism activities and then they write a report about tourism. It's a great trip and a lot of people take geography for that reason. Sadly, tragically, due to the uncertainty and the various alert levels and so on, they've cancelled the trip and it wasn't able to go ahead. But the disciples weren't looking at geysers on this trip. They would be sharing the message and doing the works of Jesus. They would be practicing what he intended for them to be doing after he left. They weren't thinking about this, but Jesus has this grand plan. He was taking a risk, wasn't he? What if they stuffed it up? What if they preached heresy? What if they uh, were faced with danger and faced it with their typical degree of fear and awkwardness? And what about Judas Iscariot? Ever wondered who partnered with him on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the field trip, on the mission thing? How would he have got on? True enough. But Jesus figured that the positive experience gained by the disciples, being involved in the work of God and seeing him use them in an incredible way would be so positive, hopefully, that it would be worth the risk. And sometimes you've got to take a risk, don't you? You've got to let those little little chickens get out of the, uh, little chicks out of the nest. There's a lot to notice here in Jesus' instructions. We could spend all day on them, but I just want to highlight a few things. First of all, he tells them to go and trust. To go and trust. They didn't take a, a, a roof rack loaded with stuff, you know, a camp cooker and a tent and, and all of this kind of thing. Freeze-dried food. No, they just took a staff, their sandals, no extra pair of, uh, of uh, clothes at all. They were dependent on God and the charity of people that they met. As Jesus came in weakness and poverty, so they went out in the same way. And Christianity is at its most powerful when it comes in from the margins, unassuming. See, your king is coming, gentle and riding on a donkey. How we spread the message is possibly almost as important as the message itself. It makes me wonder how are people seeing the message of our lives as we live in this day. So first of all, go and trust. Secondly, enter and stay. They were to stay at the first place that welcomed them. They were not to flit from house to house. They weren't to be couch surfers. They were to go there and plonk themselves in one place. To find people that were open to them and hopefully open to the gospel as well. This is such a helpful principle. Stay and build a relationship with the personal person, family, whānau, village, who can introduce you to others and help you with the language and the culture. They can see your life up close as you live with them and hopefully they can be an ambassador for you in that place, even if they themselves do not come to faith. When we started up uh, the Student Life Ministry at Waikato University in the 90s, uh, one of the first things we were able to do is we had a meeting at the Christian Hostel uh, with a number of uh, church leaders in the area and Christian ministries um, that came together and we were able to share our vision. As a result of contacts made there, we were able to form a small group meeting in our house and kick off the ministry. Well, some two years later, I don't know if any of those people were involved in our ministry, but what it enabled us to do is get going, get started, build relationships, and build the ministry from there. Same principle that Jesus 
is, um, is uh, suggesting here. So that's enter and stay, and then thirdly, speak and act. What were they to preach? Repentance, for the kingdom of God is coming. That should sound familiar to you. That's how Mark starts. That's what Jesus preached. And then what were they to be doing? Healing sick people, delivering them from demonic oppression. Exactly the same things that Jesus had been doing as well. Wow. You know, we too speak the words of Jesus. We do the works of Jesus in the world. What an amazing thing. So here's the principle. We are called to share the mission of Jesus. We are not called to be couch potato Christians, but what I might call rocket salad Christians. Rocket, we are empowered by the Spirit. Salad, we provide nutritious, healthy, um, spiritual food for people. Rocket salad Christians, not potato, not couch potato Christians, not potato salad, maybe not. So how are we going with that? Time for not just a field trip, but a guilt trip? We've got to witness. We're not witnessing enough. Maybe that's true. Probably it's true. But I love the focus of Jesus' training. Verse 14 again from chapter 3. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. We too must spend time with Jesus. And as we walk with him, he will empower us and equip us and send us out to speak and act in his name. So, walk with Jesus. That's our number one mission as his disciples, to walk with Jesus. How do we do that? Spiritual disciplines, be in the word, pray and fellowship with other Christians, basically. We don't do these things because we have to do these things. We do these things because we want to build a relationship with Jesus. And as we do that, he will enable us to um, share our faith. One of the uh, things that I've been wanting to uh, give you, and I will in a couple of weeks when we're at level one, is this little booklet, Try Praying. And there's some fantastic little uh, stories and things and some exercises to do that I'm quite keen on us doing together. So uh, if we're not at level one in a couple of weeks, I think we'll just get started anyway. But there's an app, obviously, and the booklet, and some wonderful projects for us to be developing in our prayer life. It's basic stuff, but there's always room, isn't there, to go back to the basics of walking with Jesus. So look out for try, try praying in a couple of weeks. Something else that we can do is provide opportunities for training and mission to help us put our faith on the line, to take a calculated risk, to trust God and see him work. One of those opportunities is coming up. It's, it's what I might call a lower shelf opportunity. It's not hugely scary, but it is a wonderful opportunity for mission. We've been invited along with other churches to be part of the Auckland Christmas Parade at the end of November. And the idea is in the one hour before the parade starts, we will be um, going um, along the parade route, singing Christmas carols, um, not about Santa, but about Jesus and uh, wearing t-shirts that say Jesus is the reason for the season. A very positive, enjoyable, fun addition to the Christmas parade, which, as you know, the floats light up here on Vincent Street every year. So uh, great to be involved with that. So we'll give you an opportunity um, in the email today and in the next uh, couple of weeks to order the t-shirt. And uh, it's $15 if you can give, but if not, feel free, there is a donor as well, and you can get that t-shirt free. We just need to know your size. Uh, so we can all wear those lovely red, Jesus is the reason for the, for the I was gonna say t-shirt, <laughs> for, for the season. So that'll be great. Uh, Megan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, are making a new life for themselves in California, as we know. They have just signed a multi-year deal with Netflix to make a bunch of documentaries, films, children's shows, etc. Got to make a living, I guess. They are not shy. 
they are promoting their brand as they work out what they do other than the royal duties that they had to do in the UK. We will have different opinions about this, I'm sure, and everyone has an opinion about Meghan and Harry. But they are putting themselves out there, aren't they? And so must we. In Mark 4.21, Jesus says to the disciples, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? No. Don't you put it on a stand instead? I'm not talking about deals with Netflix, although some believers will be called to be involved in the media, sharing the gospel that way. But I'm talking about choosing to put ourselves out there as individuals and as a church, as followers of Jesus in the world. We can choose to have the COVID blues and go into retreat. We're just going to look after what we've got, you know, and uh, take no risks, um, you know, just preserve, stabilize, whatever. Friends, there are times to keep your heads down. And I tell you, this is not that time. The pandemic and its repercussions presents us with a world of need, of uncertainty and of real pain. What better time to offer the words and works of Jesus in a practical way? Even as we speak, I believe, thousands and thousands of masks are making their way over from Hong Kong to our church that we are going to give out to people in the community. We're talking a lot of masks here. They are disposable, but uh, there's a lot of them. And what a lovely opportunity to share the love of Christ and give people something which has suddenly become the height of fashion in Aotearoa these days. So look out again for the masks project that is coming, coming soon to ACPC. I love, love, love the words that Mordecai says to Queen Esther. Mordecai was his was her uncle and mentor and the very, very famous words that, uh, that he says to her when she has an opp opportunity to save her people, perhaps. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Friends, this time is such a time for ACPC and followers of Jesus throughout our nation to offer ourselves to be part of God's mission. It's our choice. It's our choice. So. That's part one of uh, today's message, the training of the twelve. Now part two, the cornering of the king. You'll notice that uh, alliteration, I couldn't help but having a bit of that. Okay, well, Herod wasn't really a king. He was appointed by the Romans to be the top dog in Galilee, a tetrarch uh, to be precise. Galilee, of course, is the area that the first half of Mark focuses in on where Jesus has been preaching and doing his miracles and revealing himself. And in 614 we read that Herod had heard about all these things that were happening. I mean, how could he not? The so-called messianic secret was anything but a secret at this point in the story. But we see also that he has a guilty conscience. Could it be John the Baptist risen from the dead, he thought, perhaps to torment him? like the ghost of Christmas past in Dickens' Christmas Carol. And then we hear the story of John the Baptist's tragic death. It's Herod's birthday party. It's a lavish affair with plenty of wine, woman, and song, as decadent as you would expect of an amoral Roman puppet king. king. But there's an even darker underbelly to the story because languishing in prison, less than 10 minutes walk away from the dining room where everyone is living it up, lies John the Baptist in prison. Why? For calling out Herod's flagrant sin in stealing his brother's wife, Herodias. Herodias is not happy 
that John the Baptist has called them out on this and has been preaching against their behavior. She wants to get rid of John the Baptist. But Herod believes that he is a righteous man. And so he languishes. So at his party, he is in high spirits. And then his stepdaughter dances seductively before him. And he is delighted. So much so that he makes a rash promise. Chapter 6, verse 22. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half the kingdom. As if it was her, his to give, but anyway. Now, there's a reason that Jesus warns elsewhere against the taking of oaths in this way. In those days, oaths were far more than the old school ground, cross my heart and hope to die kind of thing. They were the sort of thing you said and you kept. There was just no comprehension that you would not keep an oath. You were bound. You bound yourself by that promise. But filled with wine, woman and song, carried away by the, uh, the occasion and his stepdaughter's seductive dancing, he is not thinking clearly. And this often happens in these kind of environments. Fortunately, we can't have that many in our parties at the moment, so the, the, uh, the temptation is lessened. Anyway, verse 24, the girl went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. She is ready, isn't she? She doesn't have to think about it. She's been thinking about this for months, maybe a year. At once, the girl hurried into the king with a request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king is cornered. He should have had John the Baptist released before this. By waiting, he has enabled Herodias to bide her time and exact her revenge. The man that Jesus describes as that fox has himself been outfoxed by her, and he has only himself to blame. To his refusal to repent of his sin, Herod now adds the sin of unjust, baseless, public murder. It is a gory end to the life of this prophet. But his life cannot be judged on the humiliating nature of its end. Jesus said of those born of woman, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is an example of costly discipleship. His was a life of radical obedience to God, faithfully calling people to repent right up until he was silenced. And probably, like Abel who was killed by his brother Cain, even after his death, his blood cried out in accusation in Herod's nightmares that he was guilty. John the Baptist reminds us that the most important people in the kingdom are not those in power, but those who are powerless. Children, the poor, the weak, the despised. And that God is not necessarily pleased with the results of our ministry, but our obedience to him and our faithfulness in it. Herod reminds us, and here's the principle that I want to highlight today, to choose to listen to the voice of of God, to keep our ears open and our hearts soft towards him. What did John the Baptist call people to do, not just Herod? Everyone. Repent, maybe not Jesus, but everyone else. Repent. Turn from your sin. Send that woman back to her rightful husband and turn back to God. You know, repent is still a very frequent word that the Spirit is saying to us today very, very frequently, we need to hear that word, repent. The New Zealand Anglican Prayer Book has a lovely prayer of confession that may be familiar to some of you, certainly to millions of Christians. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, in the good we have not done. We have sinned in weakness, we have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us 
through our Saviour Christ's sake and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. It's good to put some more detail in there. That's the nature of confession, to admit our sin to God. But really, it's a fantastic prayer, isn't it? It calls sin sin, doesn't excuse it, whatever the reason, and asks for God's forgiveness, which he freely grants. We are apt to downplay confession today. We don't want to offend people. Maybe we should wear a wrist, a wrist brand, a wrist, a wrist band, WWJTB. D. What would John the Baptist do? <laughs> what he would do is say, repent, is what he would say. And actually Jesus says the same thing, repent. We must never stray far from our sin, the reality of our sin, and the power of the cross. Jesus has paid it all. The absolution which the priest gives in the uh, Eucharist service puts it beautifully. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy on you, pardon you, and set you free. Know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Amen. This is the daily choice that all of us have. To hear the word of God, and to act on it. When we keep ignoring his promptings, when he speaks to us about areas of our life that need to, we need to pay attention to, if we keep ignoring those promptings like Herod and his ilk, then soon we stop hearing the voice of God altogether. Jesus says a couple of chapters later, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for, my, for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Who saved their life, Herod or John the Baptist? Who forfeited their soul? That's right. Dazzled by power, pleasure, and the pursuit of popularity, Herod ended up losing everything. And John the Baptist, entered the presence of God and heard his master's voice. Well done, good and faithful servant. So today we've looked at two examples of the choices we must all make. The choice to follow Jesus into the world or to say stay, stay safe on our cushion and let our light be hidden under the table. And we've also looked at the choice to listen to God and obey his voice or ignore his promptings and end up with a hard heart. Our own pulse, the only thing that we hear, like a drumbeat counting down toward our doom. Hudson Taylor was called by God to go to China in the 19th century. Like the 12 disciples, he trusted God to supply what he needed for the mission. He wrote in his diary, my God shall supply all my need. To him be all the glory. I would not, if I could, be otherwise than I am, entirely dependent upon the Lord and used as a channel of help to others. Oh, it is, a, is sweet to live thus directly dependent upon the Lord who never fails us, being assured that it was the Lord's work and that the Lord would provide. And provided he did. By the time he died, the mission agency that Hudson Taylor founded was the largest in the world. The historian Kenneth La Tourette wrote, Hudson Taylor was one of the greatest missionaries of all time and one of the four or five most influential foreigners who came to China in the 19th century for any purpose. Admiring Hudson Taylor's fruitfulness is easy. Copying his ministry is not so easy. It is costly. When the full force of the Chinese Boxer Revolution struck his missionaries in 1900, 58 of the adults and 21 of the children were murdered. Proclaiming that Jesus was the true king in China won many converts, 
but it also won him many enemies as well. But Hudson Taylor had known what to expect when he set out on his mission. He wrote home during his early days in China and declared defiantly, if I had a thousand pounds, China should have it. If I had a thousand lives, China should have them. No, not China, but Christ. Can we do too much for him? Can we do enough for such a precious saviour? Can we? The choice is ours. Hey, well, thank you again for being part of the service. And it's been really good to be able to gather with our small group and present this before you. And I pray that uh, the Lord would continue to speak to you. And you, as you hear his voice um, and respond to him, you would be excited like the disciples when they came back from their field trip and said, wow, Lord, even the demons submit to us. And so may we experience the joy of being in mission with Jesus. So um, have a great week, everyone. Sadly, it is still 2.5 in Auckland or 2 in the rest of the country or in the rest of the world, wherever you are. Um, may you know the presence of God and, um, and see those opportunities around you for mission as well. So now may the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.